All right, good morning, everybody. So I'm going to start by making some announcements. Um, quiz two uh, will come back on Monday. Uh, there's still people actually waiting to write quiz two this week. I can't hand it back until um, they've actually written it. Uh, and also, I haven't finished marking it yet. So that'll come back on Monday. So you get it back on the last day of class. Um, if the marks are done uh, before that, I'll post the marks on OnCue um, before I hand them back. Uh, so that's quiz two. You've got an assignment. Oh. Um, unfortunately, that means you have to show up for a Monday 8.30 class if you want to pick up your quiz in class. Otherwise, I'll leave them outside my door uh, at my office. Uh, also on Monday, I guess we'll talk about the exam. Um, and as for Thursday's class, uh, I'm going to propose we don't have a class on Thursday um, because we're going to be finished the I.O. stuff today. Uh, and it doesn't make sense to talk about, to start talking about processes because I basically I'm going to get to, I'm going to tell you what a process is and that's basically going to be the end of the class. Um, so it doesn't really make sense to have another lecture uh, after this one. So no class Thursday, Qu uh, quiz comes back on Monday. Uh, assignment four is supposed to come back, well, it's supposed to come back today. I don't know if that's going to happen because I looked last night and it looks like there's still a lot of assignments that need to be marked. So it's supposed to come back uh, today, I think. Um, hopefully it happens later this, uh, later this evening. Um, but it should come back to you before the end of term. Uh, assignment five, no, the, the, the TAs will then get assignment five later today or tomorrow. And then I'm probably going to mark assignment six as soon as you guys hand it in. Um, it just happens to be the case that I'm a lot faster at marking than the TAs. Uh, and so I'll, I'll probably chug through assignment six so that you get everything back before your exam. All the uh, assignment and quiz solutions, they'll all be posted on OnQ as well. So you'll have access to those. Uh, there's already a bunch of old exams with answers, actually, uh, on OnQ. Um, there's no current exam. Uh, so that's the only thing that's kind of missing. Um, so I will consider posting a sample current exam, although I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, the old, uh, the old, a lot of the old programming questions from the previous exams are still relevant uh, for this course. Uh, all right, so uh, I guess in today's class, I'm going to finish off doing input, I, uh, input and output, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the current assignment give you some pointers on how you might consider doing it, uh, and then uh, that'll wrap things up for today. Uh, so we were talking about, at the end of last class, uh, the, file, the position in a file. Right, so when you're reading or writing to a file, um, ignore appending because appending's weird. Right, so when you're reading or writing to a file, everything happens at the current file position. Right. So you can get the current file position by using ftel. You can move to a specified file position using fseek. Uh, but fseek is strange, especially if you read the documentation, uh, the official documentation for it. Uh, so I'm going to explain to you exactly what fseek does. Right, so fseek, uh, given an open file, will move to some position in the file. Now the way you tell it to move to a position is very uh, there are a few different ways that you can do it. So there's an offset and there's an origin. Now the offset is not the absolute file position uh, all the time. Right? So you might think that I want to move to position 24 in the file, that moves you to the 23rd character. Right? It does as long as you specify that the origin is um, uh, seek set. Right? So if, if the origin is the value seek set, then the offset is the position measured from the beginning of the file. Right, so you can treat it as those as a regular array index. Right, but often what you want to do is you're in a file somewhere and you would like to go to the next character or the character before. Right, and so if you set origin to seek cur, then the offset is the um, offset relative to that position. Right, so if you have one and seek cur, that goes to the next character. If you have minus one and seek cur, that goes back to the previous character. Right. Uh, and finally, there is the possibility of seeking from the end of the file, right? And so if origin is seek end, then the offset is measured relative to the end of the file. The problem with seek end is that the standard says binary streams are not, support, uh, are not required to support seek end. And so that means Linux, right? In Linux, your uh, fseek function may or may not work if you pass it in the um, uh, origin seek end. Right, so we'll ignore that for now. 
right? So we're going to use uh, seek cur in this example. All right, so we're going to use this little example here um, is going to use uh, seek set right there. So it's going to be similar to the example from the previous class, right? We're going to open up that file that consists of A, B, C, D, E, uh, A, B, C, D, next line, F, G, H, and so on and so on and so forth, right? It's going to ask you to uh, specify a position to seek to. Right? So we're going to use uh, seek set to search from the beginning of the file. Right. Uh, we'll use fget to read the input from the user. Right. Uh, we'll convert that number to an integer using a to i. Right. We'll do a little bit of error checking here. Right. Make sure that the uh, offset, make sure that the position, because it's measured from the beginning of the file, is not negative. Right. If it is, we just exit. Right. Um, otherwise, if the position is between 0 and 23, Right, we're just going to use fseek to seek to a position in the file. Then we'll read the character of that position and print that character. Right. And hopefully I've got this program kicking around somewhere. Uh, seek. OK, so 0. Right, that should be the A. That's good. 1 should be the B. 2 should be the C. Right, 20, uh, 22 is supposed to be the T. Something funny happens here, right? Um, try some more numbers here, 17. I guess we found the new line character at position 17, right? And notice that the output's a bit screwed up, uh, minus one. So a negative number to exit, right? OK, so I'll let you play around and see if you can figure out why the output is slightly screwed up when you enter in. Um, a uh, number that it seemingly consists of two digits, right? Uh, so there's a little, there's something a little bit funny in this program here. Uh, play around with it and see if you can find out what's going on. But that illustrates the purpose of fseek, right? You can move somewhere in the file. Okay, so if you want to read and write to the file at the same time, uh, so for example, you would like to edit the file, um, then you can open it up in one of the, uh, what are they called? One of the, uh, um, one of the update modes. So if you have a plus sign in the mode when you open up the file, you're opening it up in what's called update mode, R plus, W plus, and A plus, right? In these modes, you can do input and output at the same time, right? So in other words, you can write uh, a single car or you can read a single car at the same time. You can write an entire string uh, at the same time, but it overwrites uh, a bunch of characters in the file when you write the string, right? So writing uh, does not insert into the file, it overwrites existing characters in the file. There's uh, some funny rules that you uh, have to remember if you're actually going to try to do this in practice, right? For our purposes, we're not so concerned with these, right? So it, it turns out that you have to, when you're doing mixed reading and writing operations, uh, you have to call some, sometimes you have to call another function in between the read and the write, right? So those two lines tell you about that. We're going to ignore that for now. It, we're not going to encounter that problem right now in this course, right? So here's a here's a file, uh, sorry, a program that replaces every occurrence of a single character in a file, right? So the program is called replace car, right? You give it a file name, you tell it the character that you want to replace, and you give it the replacement character, right? So one, two, three, four command line arguments. Uh, yeah, sorry, one, two, three command line arguments plus the name of the file, so there's four, right? This always catches people on the exam or on a quiz, right? Remember, arg count is always the number of arguments plus one, right? The plus one comes from the name of the program. Okay, so the input file, right? That's the, technically, it's the, it's the second command line argument, right? Because the first one, sorry, it's the second thing in argv, because the first thing is the name of the program, right? So the first command line argument is stored in argv1, and it's a string, right? I'm going to open up this file in r plus mode, so um, uh, read update mode, so I can read and write at the same time. You can do, uh, I'm going to use r update because I don't want to uh, delete the file before I update it. Right? If you use W plus, then you're going to uh, delete the file before you update. 
right? So this is uh, does not delete before you update. Right, the target character is the uh, technically it's the third command line argument, right? So first, second, third. Right? You have to remember the command line arguments are strings, so it's the first character of the third argument. Right? So it's in argv2, and it's the first character. Right? So there's this uh, double bracket notation here. Right? The replacement character is in 1, 2, 3, so it's in the fourth um, command line. One, yeah, it's in the fourth. Right? So it's the fourth command line argument, but it's the first character of the fourth command line argument. So fourth, uh, fourth command line argument is argv3. Right, the first character of that string is argv3 zero. Right. So there's my target character, there's my replacement character. Right, now all I'm gonna do is read this uh, file in one line at a time. Uh, sorry, one character at a time. Right, every time I see a character that matches the target, right, I'm going to write, uh, overwrite that character with the replacement character. Now the problem is to determine whether or not we've matched the target character, I have to use fgetc right, to read in the character. But that advances the file position to the next character. So if I want to overwrite the character that I just read in, I have to one and then overwrite. Right, so our standard loop, right, read the file one character at a time until we encounter the end of the file or until we encounter a read error of some kind. Right, every time we read a character, store it in C. Right, if C is the target character, right, remember the file position has moved one position forward because we just used uh, F get C. Right, so write in a character, file position moves one. Right, back up one, so f seek, right, minus one uh, from the current position, so let's seek cur. Right, so not seek set, seek sets from the beginning. Right, now I back up to the character I just read in, read in, so I can now do f put c, put the replacement character in to the file f. Right, so that overwrites the character we just read in and then moves to the next character. All right, so I need a text file of some kind. So what's in simple? Okay, so I'm gonna try to replace the L's with something else. Uh, so this is in simple, right? So the replacement character is the L and the target character is, um, let's do a question mark. Uh, no, let's not do a question mark, let's do at. Okay, cat, and there you go. So that will go in and replace a character in the file for you. Okay, so the way that um, writing, so this is, uh, this example here illustrates one of the weaknesses with the um, fundamental design aspects of Unix. All right, so in Unix, everything is a stream of bytes, which includes your file, right? So you can think of it as just being a big array of bytes. Uh, so that means if you want to try to, uh, so that, what that means is that you cannot insert into the stream, right? You can overwrite things in the stream, right? But you can't insert or delete things from the stream because now it's no longer a continuous stream of data, right? One character followed by another, followed by another, right? Uh, so although you can overwrite a single character in the stream, but what you can't do is you can't take a character and replace it with a string. Right, because when you try to replace that single character with a string, right, the second, third, and fourth characters of the string overwrite the next, the next, next, and the next, next, next character uh, that are currently in the stream. Right. Similarly, with delete, there's no way to delete. Right. I can remove a character. I can overwrite a char the current character, but I can't cause the remaining characters in the stream to shuffle up one, which is what you'd have to do to delete a character. Right. And so this is actually a fundamental limitation of the way that Unix works. Right. Uh, and it's one of the, it's one of the main criticisms um, that people have of the uh, design of the Unix operating system. Right. Nevertheless, it's still with us now. Right. So this, uh, that slide there explains that you can't insert or, um, insert or delete a uh, character from the file. Right. Now, of course, this seems like a perfectly natural operation that you'd want to do. Right. Uh, it seems super useful. I can go into a file and replace every occurrence of a string with a longer or shorter substring, right, which involves insertion or deletion. Right, so if you want to do such a thing, right, you have some options. Right, so number one, you read the entire file into memory. So suck the file into a big array. Right, 
now perform the necessary insertion deletions on your own, right? Which we've sort of done, right, when we implemented the list, right? So when we implemented the list, we saw how you can insert into the middle of the list, and we saw how you can remove elements from the middle of the list, right? This is the sort of operation that you now want to do, right? Uh, and so also remember that when you're doing these sort of things on a list, right, every time you insert or delete from the middle of a list, about an array-based list anyway, right? It's an ON operation, right? And so this is a potentially very expensive operation unless you, uh, um, unless you pay careful attention uh, to the data structures that you're using to solve the problem, right? You might consider using a linked list of characters here because now insertion and deletion, uh, assuming you process the list uh, from, from start to end in one pass, right? Every time you insert or delete, that potentially only has O one time. Right. So there's an example of when using a linked list might actually be useful, right, as opposed to an array-based list. Right. Uh, the alternative is you read from the file, and so as you read characters from the file, right, you simultaneously write characters to a second output file. Right. So read in a character. If it's not the thing you want to replace, write it immediately to a, another output, to a different output file. Right? When you read in a character that you want to replace with a string, right, you write out the replacement string to the output file. Right? Now, of course, here you have to deal with the fact that you created a second file. Right? So if you wanted to do the, if you wanted to make the replacement keeping the, uh, sorry, overwriting the original file, you now have to take the new file and overwrite the old file. Right? But that's not so terrible to do. Right? So there are solutions for this problem but you can't do it by simultaneously reading and writing to the file at the same time. Okay. Um, where is... Uh, all right, so let's look at the assignment very quickly. All right, so in the assignment, um, you're asked to implement a few functions. Right, so all of the functions operate on a file that's already open, right? So remember when you're implementing these functions, don't open the file, don't close the file, right? The file is already open. So you end up, you end up with a pointer to a file already, right? So you don't have to open or close the file yourself. Can everybody read this? Is this big enough? Yes, okay. All right, so the first function reads from the file. Uh, it reads uh, count int values from the file, storing the values in the specified array. Right, so you're told how many integers to read from the file, right? You can assume that the file, the integers in the file, they are separated with spaces, right? So they're not separated with commas or colons or something else, right? They're all separated with spaces, right? So this is a very easy function to implement, right? You write a loop that runs that many times, right? Each time in the loop, you just use fscanf to read in an integer, right? fscanf takes care of skipping over white space for you, right? Which in this case is convenient but which in other cases may not be so convenient, right? Uh, and that's it, right? Every time you read in a file, uh, number, just store it in that array, right? This one assumes that the array has, that you're passing an array that's already been allocated, right? So you don't even have to do an array allocation in this question. This is one loop and one line inside the loop. That's it. Okay, so once you've got that function done, right? The next function is read a line from the file, right? Do it one character at a time, right? So it asks you specifically read the read the file in one character at a time, store it in this string s, right? So again, you're going to assume that that string is already allocated for you, right? You're told what the maximum length of the line is, right? So this is basically the easiest version of the problem that you uh, that you can be asked for, right? You know how long the line is, right? You've got a pre-allocated string, right? The file's already open for you. Read it one character at a time, right? Uh, and you're supposed to read it in an entire line, right? So in other words, you read in everything, right, until you see the new line character, right? You consume the new line character and then stop, right? But you don't put the new line character into the string, right? So this is almost uh, f gets, right? But not it's not but not quite. Right. And so to implement this, if you're going to read it one character at a time, just use f get c, right? Write a loop that runs until you see the new line character. Uh, what is this? 
Right, so if you read max length characters and you haven't seen the new line character yet, uh, you're supposed to return false, right? So there's no, um, if the string is large enough to hold that many characters, uh, there's no uh, overflow problem here, right? I think this also says to stick a null terminator, yes. So always write the null terminator into the end of the string, right? So beware of the trap. Right, make sure that you don't, uh, where is it, sorry, just a second here. Reads characters from, stop, or when, yes, okay, right. Uh, so you can read max length characters, right? And so if you don't see the new line character and you have to append the null terminator to the end of S, right, that means S has to be at least max length plus one in length. Right, and so when you allocate your array for S, make sure you do max length plus one to allocate the array, right? There's even, uh, the assignment even tells you, uh, even gives you advice on how to implement these functions here, right? Notice this one says don't use fgets, right? Because that's basically one call to fgets and that will implement that thing for you. So the next problem is slightly harder. So this assumes that you have a string and you would like to uh, extract the numbers from the string, right? So you've got a string consisting of a bunch of numbers. The numbers are separated with a comma. There's no spaces in the string, right? All of this stuff is uh, specified to make your life easy for the assignment, right? Because as soon as you put spaces in the string, um, you, this, this becomes a lot more complicated to deal with, right? Uh, so this time you have to al allocate an array, right? So this one asks you to read in some number, some string, some numbers from an array, uh, sorry, some numbers from a string that are uh, where the numbers are separated with commas, store them in an array, right? Now the problem you have to deal with here is you don't know how many numbers are in the string, right? So you have to process this, so there's a few ways to deal with this problem, right? The easiest way to deal with this particular problem is to process the string twice, right? Read the string once, look for all the commas in the string that more or less tells you how many numbers are in the string, right? Now read the string a second time, right? This time as you read the string, probably using S scan F, right? You actually know how to, uh, sorry, not, not necessarily using S scan F, right? Um, once you know how many numbers are in the string, you can allocate an array to hold the numbers, right? And now your job is how do I break the string up into the numbers, right? And so you can use, S-T-R-T-O-K in this example here, right? You can use it in this example because, uh, because of, this, of the specification up here, right? Everything's separated with commas. There are no blank numbers, right? So there are no missing numbers, right? There's no spaces in the string, uh, anywhere in the string, right? So this is a pretty straightforward application of S-T-R-T-O-K, should you choose to do so, right? If you wanna do it a little fancier, you can try to use sscanf, right? So sscanf is the function that scans a string for formatted data, right? Uh, and so the question here goes into some explanation as to how, what the pattern is that you're going to use to read the string, right? But the part that's missing is I haven't told you how to use sscanf uh, in order, uh, I haven't told you enough about sscanf in order to solve this particular problem. So remember, when you're scanning a string, it works the same as scanning a file. Every time you consume something in the string, right, you have to remember where are you now in the string, right? And so suppose we've got the numbers one, then a comma, then two, and then a comma, oops, two, and then a comma, uh, 100, 199 and then a comma, and then so on and so on and so on, right? So you can use sscanf to read this thing in one character at a time, or sorry, one number at a time, right? So you're gonna read in the first character, uh, the first number, sorry, not the first character, the first number, and then you're gonna write a loop. You're gonna try to consume a comma and an, and an integer every time, right? So the pattern is integer, comma, integer, comma, integer, comma, integer. Right, you can read the comma integer pretty straightforward with sscanf. Right. Right. 
So S is going to be a pointer somewhere. Right? So the we're going to start with S there. Right? Uh, that's the string you want to parse. Your formatting string is, uh, but, but what is it? It's going to be comma, right? Percent D. And then you need somewhere to store the value. So address value, right? Has to be a pointer because you need to write into a uh, integer value here, in a variable that can hold an integer, right? So the function needs a pointer to an integer in order for it to write into that variable there, right? So this is great. So you run this starting from here, right? So that'll read in the comma and the two, right? Now the problem with scanf is if you use it this way, right? You don't know where it stops, right? So it reads in the comma and the two. Something's going on with my array. Uh, we'll just do that. So that's comma, ninety-nine, right? So you read in the comma and the two, but you don't know where that two, right? You know where that is in the array, right? Because that could be any number. That could be like a five-digit number or a seven-digit number or something like that, right? But you need to move s to the next comma in order to uh, call s scan f in the next loop iteration, right? And so what you really want to know is character f scan f consume when it did that last operation. Right? And so there's another conversion that you can use. Okay. So comma, integer, percent n. Right? Percent n returns the number of characters that are consumed uh, up until this point right here and when it reaches the percent n. Right? So if it consumes a comma and one comma and then one digit, right? That percent n is going to be uh, that percent n will convert to two, which you can store somewhere else. Comma, so address num, right? Where num is a variable that holds the number of characters that were just consumed, right? So num in this case will be two because it eats the percent the comma and two, right? Once you know what num is. You now know how far to advance s, right? So, so that moves it. Next iteration, right? And so you need to know about that percent n conversion here if you want to use s scanf. Right. Now, for those of you at home, you missed all of that on the lecture board, on the on the blackboard. So, in the strings notebook. Uh, so the strings notebook goes into much greater detail into how to use strings uh, than I actually covered in the lectures. But if you go to the strings notebook, there's an example that actually tries to read in strings, comma separated strings instead of comma separated numbers, right? And it takes you through the entire sequence of getting up to the point, that point there, right? The example in the notebook is more complicated than this. This actually shows you how to read in strings that have spaces in them. But eventually, you'll get to this point here. So the percent n specifier for getting the number of characters read so far. Right. So if you follow through the notebook with these examples, uh, the assignment problem is becomes more or less trivial. Right. The notebooks basically tell you how to solve this problem. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Uh, what's going on? They're doing some maintenance on the alarms. Okay, so the uh, assignment also sort of tells you how to do it, but the notebooks goes into much greater detail if you want if you want to try to do it this way, right? If you just want to get the assignment done, just use SDRT, okay, right? It's by far the easiest way to solve this one. Okay, and then the uh, last part of the question is uh, now that you've got your array of numbers, decode the array. For that, you just read the assignment, and um, it's pretty straightforward for decoding the array. All right, so that's all I want to say about the assignment, which is probably more than I should have, but whatever. Um, and I think that's it. So I think we're done uh, talking about input and output. Um, again, I don't think there's any point talking about processes uh, at this point in the course. You're going to learn it in your operating systems course anyway. 
um, assuming you take operating systems. Uh, and so I think uh, we'll just call it quits for today. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, yeah, I'm never going to ask you to regurgitate some algorithm that you learned in some previous course, right? Um, I might give you some algorithm that you learned in some previous course, and then you have to reinterpret it and see. But I would never ask you to come up with it from memory. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? All right. So I will see you on Monday.